So in addition to serving as a soldier, statesman, and Supreme Court justice, we here at the museum frequently look back to a time in December 1831, when soon after its founding, John Marshall accepted the position as first president of the new Virginia Historical and Philosophical Society, which later became known as the Virginia Historical Society. And Marshall uh, gave the society a great gift, a cop one of its first collections pieces, a copy of his very own Life of George Washington inscribed to the society uh, by the author. So as Marshall and our organization have a 187 year relationship, we are very happy to bring to you this evening's program, which is the result of a wonderful partnership with some other esteemed Virginia organizations, the John Marshall Foundation, Preservation Virginia's John Marshall House, and the American Civil War Museum. And we are fortunate to have with us Lacey Ward Jr., the executive director of the John Marshall Foundation, who will introduce our program. Lacey. Did you pick up all the papers? <laughs> he had me scared for a second. Good evening. I'd also like to point out that uh, Elizabeth Costelny, leader of our partner organization, Preservation Virginia, which owns the John Marshall House, is also uh, with us tonight. Uh, as Andy said, my name's Lacey Ward. I'm executive director of the John Marshall Foundation. Uh, where we exist to educate the public about the rule of law under the Constitution through the life, character, and service of America's great Chief Justice. Tonight, Dr. Paul Finkelman and Dr. Edward L. Ayers will engage in a conversation about Dr. Finkelman's latest book, Supreme Injustice, Slavery in the Nation's Highest Court. And it's now my honor to introduce our two <coughs> conversationalists. First, Dr. Ayers. Ed Ayers is President Emeritus of the University of Richmond, uh, where he serves as Tucker Boatwright Professor of the Humanities. He also serves as Board Chair of the American Civil War Museum, another co-sponsor tonight. A historian of the American South, Ayers has written and edited 10 books. In the Presence of Mine Enemies, Civil War in the Heart of America, won the Bancroft Prize for Distinguished Writing in American History and the Beveridge Prize for the best book in English on the history of the Americas since 1492. He was awarded the National Humanities Medal in 2013. A pioneer in digital history, Ayers created the Valley of the Shadow, two communities in America's Civil War, a website that has attracted millions of users and won numerous prizes in the teaching of history. Ayers has received a presidential appointment to the National Council of the Humanities, served as a Fulbright professor in the Netherlands, and has been elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. His latest book, In the Thin Line of Freedom, The Civil War and Emancipation in the Heart of America, was winner of the 2018 Gilder Lehrman Lincoln Prize. <coughs> and Dr. Paul Finkelman. Dr. Finkelman is president of Gratz College. He received his BA in American Studies from Syracuse University and his PhD in History from the University of Chicago. He was later a fellow in law and humanities at Harvard Law School. He's held a number of endowed chairs as a tenured professor or a visitor, including the Ariel F. Swallows Chair in Human Rights and Law at the University of Saskatchewan, the John Hope Franklin Chair in American Legal History at Duke Law School, and the President William McKinley Distinguished Professor at Albany Law School. He's the author of more than 200 scholarly articles and the author or editor of more than 50 books. His latest book, Supreme Injustice, Slavery in the Nation's Highest Court, is the subject of tonight's discussion. And now, Supreme Injustice. Great, thanks very much. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> it's good to see everyone this evening. Uh, I don't want to undercut our uh, credibility, but I believe the last time we worked together was in Hawaii. <laughs> 
uh, a number of years ago. It, it, was, it was a very difficult job. Yeah, it was. Uh, to, to get to the venue. Yeah, that's right. But we were glad to be there. We're glad to be with you tonight. And uh, as you just heard from Lacey, uh, Paul is a remarkable scholar um, who uh, tackles a remarkably broad range of things. And, and tonight, we're, he, he's written a brief book that covers a broad range of things. I want to sample this in our conversation and then plant a seed for questions uh, from you a little bit down the line. So Supreme Court, one of their major jobs is to interpret the Constitution. So let's start with the Constitution, OK? Uh, the famous abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison says the Constitution is a covenant with death and an agreement with hell because of its sanction of slavery. Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass disagreed. What's Paul Finkelman think? They're both right, <laughs> of course. Uh, I'm following in Ed's uh, steps. I just became a college president, so I'm having to learn how to say things uh, that are politic. <laughs> Uh, I've, I've watched him over the years transition. Uh, I agree. That's an excellent point you just <laughs> made. Huh? So, so, so let me explain. Um, the Constitution of 1787 was enormously pro-slavery. And uh, most Americans either don't want to hear this or don't want to think about it. Uh, at the Constitutional Convention, the very first day, the debate is sh how would you structure the new legislature and Edmund Randolph, the governor of Virginia, suggests that you would uh, count all the people and allocate representation accordingly. And immediately somebody says, well, she, we should amend this to count only the free people. And right away, you are in the middle of a debate. Mm -hmm. And the debate is, does Virginia get a substantial number of members of the House of Representatives merely because there are a lot of slaves in Virginia? Virginia has the largest population. But if you take away the slaves, it's the second largest population. North Carolina is the fourth biggest state. If you don't count the slaves, it's the fifth biggest state. These things matter in terms of the allocation of political right. power. In the end, we get what's called the three-fifths clause. Mistakenly, people think the clause says African Americans are three-fifths of a person. That's not what it says. It says that you will count all the free people, including free blacks, and then you will add to that three-fifths of the unfree people or the slaves. Uh, the result is, is that the southern states get a huge bonus in the House of Representatives from the first Congress until 1860. Furthermore, because the Electoral College is structured by giving electors based on the numbers you have in the House of Representatives and adding the two senators, the South gets a bonus there. Thomas Jefferson would not have been elected president in 1800 if the Electoral College had not folded slavery into the mix. So Je was, that was intentional? That was the point of the Electoral College was to reflect slavery? or did, Well, it at the Constitutional Convention, James Madison, the father of the Constitution, gets up and says the fittest thing, which would be, in our language, the most appropriate thing, he says, would be for the people to elect the president. And then he says there are two problems with that. One is that the right to vote varies from state to state. But you could easily imagine that could be fixed. And then he says, the other problem, which is more important, is our Negroes won't count. And what he means by that is Virginia will not be able to elect presidents, perhaps, because you can't weigh into this slaves. A North Carolina delegate actually taking private notes says what Madison meant by this is that Virginia won't be able to elect its people president if you don't somehow count slaves in the mix. So in one sense, uh, the Electoral College, which is arguably the most undemocratic thing in American politics today, and this does not matter who you voted for in any of five or six elections where the person with the most votes didn't win. The fact is we're the only country in the world where the person with the most votes doesn't win the election. Uh, and that's pretty weird. Um, and this was put in there to balance the power by giving the South extra power for slaves. One, one quick thing. Um, people often say, well, Wait a minute, wasn't the Electoral College designed because the uh, delegates didn't trust the voters? In all the debates at the convention, 
there is one delegate who says this. Hmm. And he ends up not signing the Constitution. The rest of the delegates love the voters. Why? Because almost everybody at the Constitutional Convention was a professional politician. Uh, <laughs> some years ago, there was discussions of term limits. And people said, you know, the founding fathers didn't expect people to stay in office. Are you kidding? <laughs> Th 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 Thomas Jefferson gets on the public dole in 1772, and he is not off the public dole with the exception of a year after his wife dies until he leaves the, the president's office in 1809. He's continuously in office. James Madison is continuously in office. Roger Sherman of Connecticut is there from the 1760s until he dies in the 1790s. These guys are perpetual office holders. They love the public because their voters are electing them. They're not afraid of the voters. So that's good. Okay, so, 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 uh, okay. so, so let me ask you. So, 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 so no, I, 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 I'm gonna okay, ask you, I'm gonna push back. <laughs> so the, the fact is that, the, that slavery is baked into the Constitution, baked into the Electoral College, but how do you account for the fact that it never mentions the word slavery? Okay, a couple of more bacons. Okay. <laughs> um, Gratz is the uh, oldest Jewish college in America, so maybe I shouldn't be into bacons. But <laughs> in any event, um, the, um, the Fugitive Slave Clause says that if your slave runs away, you can go get your slave. Under Anglo-American law, after 1772, the law is that if you do not have slavery in a jurisdiction, any slave going there, for any reason, including running away, automatically becomes free. This is a case known as Somerset v. Stewart. And so the Constitution essentially says, well, we're going to overrule Somerset for runaway slaves. There are two clauses in the Constitution where the federal government promises to suppress rebellions and insurrections. Now, all of you learned about Shays' Rebellion in high school. What you did. It will not learn. be a test, however, just in case you didn't. <laughs> Pardon? I said there was not going to be a test, just in case they yeah, didn't. Yeah, I wanted yeah, people yeah, to yeah, stay yeah, with yeah, us the whole right, time. That's right, that's right, yeah. That's right. Uh, but what you didn't learn is that Madison comes back from the convention and says they're going to help us suppress slave rebellions. The Pinckneys go to South Carolina and say, this is a great deal for us. They're going to suppress slave rebellions. Um, furthermore, Pinckney goes back, Char Charles Coatsworth Pinckney, the, the hero of South Carolina, General Charles Coatsworth Pinckney says, they can't touch slavery in the states because they don't have any power to do it. So there's a lot of bacons. Now, here's the, uh, here's the thing. During one of the debates over the African slave trade, because the Commerce Clause, which allows Congress to regulate interstate commerce, and international commerce in everything there is except the African slave trade because there's a separate clause which says Congress can't regulate the African slave trade until at least 1808. Doesn't say it has to regulate in 1808. And again, the, when I was in school, the textbook said, yeah. Constitution says slave trade ends in 1808. Right. There's still law, you know, textbooks like that. That's wrong. Huh. South Carolina was betting by 1808 they'd have the power to block a law. During that debate, one of the delegates said, you know, if we're going to do this, let's call it what it is and say South Carolina, North Carolina, and Georgia may import slaves until 1808, because that's what we're talking about. And another delegate gets up. I'm sorry, a delegate from Pennsylvania says that. And, de and another delegate from Connecticut says, no, no, we don't want to single out any states, and we shouldn't use the word slave because the voters back home might not like the Constitution. So in all of the debates, they use the word Negro and slave interchangeably. And then in the final document, they use words like such persons and other persons and persons owing service or labor. They are hiding the ball. They are trying to pull the wool over the eyes of the American people. They don't do it on the Three-Fifths Clause. They don't do it on the Slave Trade Clause. Curiously, not a single northerner that I can find, that I've tried to find them all, complains about the Fugitive Slave Clause because it's so convoluted and confusing that people may not have noticed it. But southerners come back and say, look at this clause. We can go pick up our runaway slaves. So it's all over. And yeah, they're hiding the ball. 
but everybody knows what the words mean. Everybody understands what it's all about. And you only need to look at the debates and the ratifying conventions in the South to see the Southerners cheering these clauses. So you can't help but notice that uh, the Southerners and slaveholders actually want a strong federal government. And it's, and it's the people, which seems contrary to what most people imagine was sort of ingrained in the South from the beginning. They were always about local control and state government, but you're telling us that's not the case. They're about local control for what they call the domestic institutions of the states, i.e. slavery, marriage, property law, but they love a strong national government. The most powerful centralizing federal law passed before the Civil War is the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850, which is passed by Southerners uh, with a f handful of Northerners. And by the way, if the Three-Fifths Clause had not given the South those bonuses, there are a whole bunch of compromises, Missouri Compromise, Compromise of 1850, which includes the Fugitive Slave Law, Kansas-Nebraska Act, which would not have passed Congress without that bonus from the Three-Fifths Clause. It's also worth remembering that between 1789, when George Washington becomes president, and 1861, when Abraham Lincoln becomes president, there are only, and I, I want to make sure I get this right, there are only four presidents who have no slaveholding in their background. The two Adamses, Millard Fillmore, who serves two years, and Franklin Pierce. Every other the president. Giants of the presidents. Giants of presidents, that's right. I, I, uh, the, the Lilliputians of the 1850s. Uh, <laughs> nor James Buchanan from Pennsylvania came from a slaveholding family, even though Pennsylvania was ending slavery by gradual abolition, as late as the 1820s, the Buchanan family still owned slaves. Martin Van Buren grew up in New York before slavery was abolished and owned a slave as a young man. <coughs> William Henry Harrison was from Ohio, but Virginians all know he's a Virginian and he's a slave owner who moves to Ohio. So, so in fact, there is slavery every time you turn around in the presidency, the leaders of Congress, who do we think of? We think of Henry Clay, you know, there forever. John C. Calhoun, vice president under two different presidents and in various cabinets. There are no abolitionists, there are no active opponents of slavery who are in anybody's cabinet until the Lincoln administration. You couldn't have put William Henry Seward in a cabinet, but you could put John C. Calhoun or Jefferson Davis or the great Virginian, I'm sure you all know of him, Abel Upshur, right? Everybody's on the tip of everything. People have t-shirts, the Abel Upshur. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, he's the Virginia equivalent to Millard Fillmore, right. except he didn't get to be president. So did the federal government actually help put down rebellions? Absolutely. Um, at Nat, and after Nat Turner's rebellion, the U.S. Navy is cruising up and down the James River. Um, and, of course, the most famous slave rebellion would be the one that took place in what was then Harper's Ferry, Virginia, <coughs> led by John Brown. And who put down the John Ra Brown's raid? Not the Virginia militia. Now, everybody here would say, well, it's actually West Virginia, so no wonder. But not the, not the Virginia militia. It was the United States Army, a company of Marines led by Colonel Robert E. Lee and with a lieutenant named Jeb Stewart. And they are rushed to Harper's Ferry to suppress this rebellion. Now, they should have. You know, they were attacking a federal facility. But, but here you have the state of Virginia begging the federal government to put down slave rebellions at Nat Turner, to put down the Harper's Ferry attack. It seems very close to when they were making the case for states' rights and secession, but that's another conversation, okay? <laughs> apparently it's not. Well, apparently, <laughs> uh, 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 apparently it's not in, in, in just one, one way. <laughs> the, the claim that secession is about states' rights is made by Jefferson Davis and Alexander Stevens after the Civil War. 
If you, if you want to know what they thought they were doing before the Civil War, you just go home and Google South Carolina Declaration of the Causes of Secession, because what that declaration does is to complain about northern states' rights. They complain the North allows abolitionists to talk. They complain that the North won't allow us to bring our slaves into their states and keep them there. Um, there is nothing in the South Carolina Declaration of the Ordinance, uh, Declaration of the Causes of Secession, that says we need states' rights. Why? Because they're running the show. They love the national government. But this raises this question. It's hurting my feelings as a historian not to be in chronological order. But I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, no, no. You're I'm no, sorry. No, that's okay. And we will return to chronological order, but I'm going to step outside <laughs> Thank of myself. God. Oh, my. Yeah. Because as we know, that, that's all we do is put things in chronological order. Uh, so, but to, just to finish up this line of conversation, the Republicans, when they come to power, uh, say that they have to because the slave power is running the country. It sounds to me as if you're suggesting there's a good case for them to say that. Yeah, they call it the slave power conspiracy, and I think it's unfair to the conspirators because conspirators are usually secret. And there's, <laughs> and there's nothing secret about what's going on in Congress. There's nothing secret about... Uh, and, and by the way, while it is Southerners who are leading the charge, they are always aided and abetted by a few Northerners who are called doe faces. Uh, a doe face is a northern man with southern principles, and the reason that word is, comes up is because it's said their faces are made of bread dough, and southerners could shape them into anything they want. And, and, the, and the, now you know. And now you know. And, and the best example of that would be Pennsylvania's James Buchanan, who, on the eve of the Civil War, basically tells the people of Kansas, if you will accept a pro-slavery constitution, even though probably 70% of the people in Kansas are from the North and there are probably fewer than 200 slaves in Kansas. He says, if you'll accept a pro-slavery constitution, I will admit you right away and you'll get all sorts of immediate federal benefits. So yeah, it is, a, it, it, it is hard to find any way in which slavery is harmed by Congress from let's say, 1800 forward. Go back to the 1790s if we want. But well, and we shall. For, that's chronological order. <laughs> right. so Thank you. Good. Working good. with me on this, I appreciate I, it. I, I, so, we, didn't, we didn't even script this. It no. just comes out. <laughs> so, it's, it's, a, it's a chronological conspiracy. Yeah. So we, we're, we're being partially uh, sponsored by the John Marshall Foundation. So tell me about John Marshall uh, before we talk about slavery. Just tell me about John okay. Marshall, who he was and what he did, and why he deserves all this attention. So um, John Marshall grows up in rural Virginia. Um, Fauquier. Fauquier. I, I always have to get my pronunciation right. <laughs> <laughs> he grows it, up it, We should have let him just say what he <laughs> thought it was. <laughs> he, he grows up in what is today Fauquier County. Nicely uh, done. Uh, yeah. In, in, uh, it is very rural. It is pretty wild. Uh, there are descriptions of young John Marshall wearing a coonskin cap, kind of like Davy Crockett, and carrying a tomahawk. Uh, it is the frontier. His father is a um, man on the make, works very, very hard, ultimately um, acquires a substantial amount of land, but it's pretty far west. He ultimately acquires about 25 slaves, which would make him, by Southern standards, a planter, but a very small planter. The definition of a planter is 20 slaves plus some land to work. Um, Marshall is uh, self is educated at home to a large extent. There's one year when they managed to get a, uh, a an Anglican uh, priest to come into town and, and tutor, and so he gets some formal education. But he's very well educated. His father's very well read. Uh, his father's pretty much rough and tumble. His mother, on the other hand, is related to all of the major families of Virginia, including the Randolphs and the Jeffersons. And so he has some patina of being connected to the right people. Revolution begins. His dad is the 
major in the county militia. He eventually rises to be a full colonel. Uh, you should understand that in the Revolution, uh, except for George Washington, there are only two ranks above colonel, brigadier general and major general. So being a full colonel is actually a very big deal. And so his father becomes a full colonel in the county militia. John Marshall, uh, following great, very much Virginia tradition because his dad's an officer. He gets to be an officer right away at 19. Um, he's an ensign, which is like a phony officer rank. Um, and uh, after a little while, he leaves the county militia and joins the Continental Army, serves with Washington, is in fights in, in New York, in New Jersey, in Pennsylvania. He spends the famous winter in Valley Forge. Um, this makes Marshall very different than, say, Chief Justice Tawney, who will be his successor. Uh, Tawney is from a very wealthy old Maryland family. Um, except for the three years he's at Dickinson College in Pennsylvania, Tawney lives his entire life in Maryland and Washington, D.C., very small little circle. Uh, as far as I can tell, Tawney never spends any time with anybody who isn't from his social class and his background. Um, Marshall is at the campfire with Northerners, with non-Anglicans, with people from different states. He gets a very broad education simply by being in the Army. He also becomes devoted to a strong national government. He is cold and hungry at Valley Forge because the national government is incompetent and weak and can't feed and clothe and provide blankets for the soldiers. John Marshall is a great nationalist and a lover of George Washington because of it. After the war, he becomes a lawyer. He uh, becomes almost immediately one of the most successful lawyers in Richmond. By the 1790s, he's the leader of the Federalist Party in Richmond. And he moves into politics. He serves a number of terms in the, in the Virginia legislature. He again does what every good politician does. He marries well. Uh, in this case, he marries the daughter of the treasurer of the, of the state. Uh, I always tell my students there are really only two ways to make sure that you're going to be wealthy in life. One is to have a good enough sense to pick rich parents. And the others to be smart enough to marry somebody who picked rich parents. Uh, John tries the third, which is to marry somebody who's got rich parents. Uh, and he's very successful. He serves in, in the legislature. He's uh, a very wealthy man. And, and here I just want to say something about what we're going to get into yeah, in we're a ready. minute. Yeah. As a young lawyer, just married with no children yet, living in an urban setting, in the early 1780s, John Marshall is voraciously buying slaves. And when we read his records of, of his, we have his sort of personal economic diaries for about 12 or 14 years, he casually says, bought a slave woman here bought a woman here, bought a man here. Sometimes he names them, sometimes he doesn't name them. Sometimes he names one and says, I bought John and three other slaves today. And he is accumulating far more slaves in the 1780s than any urban household would need unless you had a gigantic mansion. And Marshall does not yet have the big house he's eventually going to have. Uh, and so one of the remarkable things about Marshall is he figures out that the way to wealth, the way to success, is to invest in slaves, and he is constantly doing it. Uh, ironically, there are two entries for July 4th, one in 1784, which is the first anniversary of independence since the war ended, and the other is in 1787, while the Con Constitutional Convention is meeting in Philadelphia, John on July 4th is buying slaves. Um, now, you could say he's celebrating American independence by buying slaves because he's an independent person and he can do that. He rises in Vir Vir Virginia politics, and then his great moment comes when he is sent to France to help negotiate with, uh, with Talleyrand, the French foreign minister, and the Americans are told that they cannot meet with Talleyrand unless they pay a bribe to three French officials known as Monsieur X, Y, and Z. And Marshall writes back home about the X, Y, Z affair. 
and he is a complete failure with the negotiations in France. He's a hero when he gets back. He's immediately elected to Congress. He serves in Congress until John Adams makes him Secretary of State, and he remains Secretary of State until after John Adams is defeated for the presidency. Uh, last year, we learned uh, a new version of American history that you can never appoint a nominated Supreme Court justice in the last year of your term in office, uh, and therefore they shouldn't be confirmed. John Marshall is actually nominated in the last month of John Adams' lame duck presidency. He's nominated for the, to be Supreme Chief Justice. He is confirmed as Chief Justice, but he does not take the oath because he remains Secretary of State until the last day of the Adams administration, and then he becomes <coughs> Chief Justice of the United States. Um, it's a remarkable career. And, and he's a relatively young man. Relatively self-made. Relatively self-made. And by this time, in addition to scores of slaves, and we don't know how many, uh, but we know that he, by this time, probably is in the 50 slave range, which makes him a millionaire by today's standards. He has also purchased at least 215,000 acres of land, basically... I-66 going all the way out to Winchester, uh, everything on both sides of it, plus land in Kentucky, plus land in, in other parts of Virginia. Uh, and again, uh, I hope the Marshall Foundation and the, and the people who are studying Marshall will eventually helps, help us learn just how much land John Marshall owned, how many slaves John Marshall owned. And a lot of them would have been in Henrico County. In, in, he, he, he has a, he has a, um, a plantation, uh, what he calls Chickahominy, on the, on the, uh, on the Chickahominy, <clears throat> and uh, he is stocking this with slaves. He is buying slaves very quietly. He doesn't tell anybody he's doing this. He doesn't brag about and it. And it's not a scandal at the time or anything. It's, right? Well, it's not a scandal. It's, so, it's, so how do we put together these two strands of the story, right? So <laughs> we've got John Marshall, it, universally recognized as the greatest chief justice of the yeah. Supreme Court, and basically created the foundations for everything mm -hmm. that followed. Uh, and I will say it, your book is the first one to point out this degree of complicity in slavery. Uh, so how do we connect the, the greatest chief justice of the Supreme Court and this history of Southern slaveholder domination of the Constitution of the nation that it creates until the Civil War? How do the stories intersect? Well, the stories intersect at a couple of levels. One level is, I, I have to say something, that I'm the first one to do it because other historians have not done it. And, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, well, but, 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 but I, I mean, I mean, yeah. this, this is an important thing. Uh, it, I, so I was reading John Marshall's will and John Marshall's will says, uh, he, he, by the way, he, thankfully for historians, he rewrote his will three times. So we have three versions of the will and then there's a codicil, an addition after that. So you really get to see the guy changing in the last sort of 12 years or so of his life. And in the first version of his will, he says, I leave my slaves in Richmond to my wife, and he names 15 of them, plus the children of one of his slaves. Uh, from that, every single biographer of John Marshall says the same thing. He has a dozen house servants, as they like to call them, in Richmond. Um, it's actually 15 plus the kids, but, you know, we're not going to quibble for between a dozen and, and 18. Um, two... Paragraphs later, he says, I leave my plantation at Chickahominy to my nephew with all of the farm equipment and buildings and animals and slaves. And I'm reading this and I'm thinking, well, that's more than a dozen. <laughs> and then he says, I leave the land that my son Edward lives on in that unpronounceable county. Fuck here. Fuck here. Fuck here. Fuck here. I'm learning. <laughs> With, 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 all the, with all the usual number of slaves. And I'm scratching my head. What's the usual number of slaves? And then he says, I leave the land my son John Jr. lives on with all the usual number of slaves. And I'm beginning to think, well, this is a lot more than a dozen. <laughs> and I, I then engaged a, a woman named Candace Gray, who's a graduate student at 
now at Morgan State, uh, and who is very skilled at, at the very difficult task of sorting out census and tax <coughs> records. I said, can you figure out any of this stuff? She comes back to me and she says, there are 65 slaves at Chickahominy. And I'm thinking, that's a lot more than a dozen. <laughs> An awful lot more. I was so startled by this that I set, wrote up a couple of paragraphs, sent it to other Marshall scholars, and said, can I be right? Because it, it's very weird. You spend your whole life doing history, you're reading books that your friends have written, and you're suddenly saying, all you guys, I can't be right and all of you people are wrong. So one, one historian graciously writes back and says, I wish I'd done the research you did. Um, and the other one writes back, I was so intrigued by what you did that I went on Ancestry.com to see for myself, which I interpreted as, I'm not sure I trust you. And, and he came back and said, you're wrong about 65. There are actually only 62, because you counted the overseer's wife and kid. I'm thinking, OK, I'm wrong by three. You're wrong by 62. Who's closer? <laughs> he was closer to this. Um, and so one of the things we see is that within my profession, there are people who are so in love with their subject or so blinded by their desire to reach a certain conclusion that they don't want to follow the evidence where the evidence takes you. And I think a historian, uh, during Watergate, uh, Woodward and Bernstein always said, follow the money. And in a sense, with John Marshall, follow the money. The money leads to land. The money <coughs> leads to hundreds of thousands of acres of land. The money leads to slaves. And then you start looking at his other children. Uh, he has one children who isn't in the census in, in 1820. And in 1840, in his early 30s, I'm sorry, in 1830, in his early 30s, he's, um, he's got 47 slaves. He did not get those 47 slaves. That's today a few million dollars. Right. He did not get them by, by buying them. He got them because daddy gave them to him. And maybe his father-in-law as well. So, that, so, so, so th th this is not really a matter of interpretation? That, that this, this, is, this, okay. is, this is what's out there. But, but, so, so, so the court thing. <laughs> I, I, this is so much fun. <laughs> so, so, so here's the other piece. Every one of his biographers says he heard very few cases on slavery. Well, I did what you can now do and you've been able to do for the past 40 or 50 years, which is to do a database search to the Supreme Court. You put in slavery, the word slave, you put in just S-L-A-V-E, and you put in uh, the years 1801 to 1835, and you get 60 some odd cases. I don't know if that's a lot or a little. Then you start looking at the cases. You throw out the ones that are not related to slavery. There's one where somebody says, such and such a judge was a slave to precedent. Well, he doesn't count. Right. But here's what I did find. I found that as Chief Justice, John Marshall's court heard 14 cases in which the freedom of a black person was at issue. In some of these cases, they were slaves who had been mm -hmm imported into the city of Washington, D.C., which was regulated half by Virginia law, that what's now today Alexandria, and the rest by Maryland law. And both Maryland and Virginia did not allow you to import slaves into their states. So if you moved into Washington, D.C., as a move, moving in, you had to immediately register your slave and prove that you owned a slave. And a number of these cases involved people who were not properly registered or never registered at all. Others involved a will, where the master said, I want my slave to be free. One involved a young man whose mother was still in Maryland, and a Maryland court had ruled that she had never been a slave. Not that she was entitled to freedom by some act, but that she had never been a slave, therefore her son was never a slave when he was born. These 14 cases get to John Marshall's court. Marshall decides seven of them, and the black plaintiffs lose in every single one of the cases, including three where juries of all white men, probably including slave owners in Washington, D.C., had declared them to be free. One of them was this man whose mother was declared to be free, and the jury simply said, your mother was never a slave, therefore you've never been a slave, therefore you're free. Uh, a couple of more involved registrations. 
In all seven cases, the blacks lose. There's one other case decided by Justice Johnson of South Carolina in which the blacks lose. In the last six cases, which occur towards the end of Marshall's chief justiceship, when he is no longer controlling the court, for uh, until about 1825, it is Marshall's court. He 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 gets his way in about 95 percent of all cases. He begins to start losing in the last decade, and in that decade, there are six cases where the decisions are written by other justices, and black freedom is upheld. Now, Marshall doesn't dissent in those cases, but Marshall only dissents about five times in his whole career. It is not like today, where every justice dissents, even when they agree with the outcome, they have to write their own opinion. It's a much different world. So it sounds as if there are more opportunities for African-American freedom than we might imagine. There are. The, the, the system leaks a little bit more than we imagine. The, the system leaks. The system allows for freedom in a variety of ways. Um, one way is for masters to simply free their slave. To give you the Virginia example, in, uh, in um, 1782, Virginia passes a law which says masters may free their slaves if they wish, and the ex-slaves can remain in Virginia. And between 1782 and 1810, the Virginia free black population goes from about 2,000 to 30,000. That's a lot of Virginians giving up a lot of wealth because they can't stand the notion that they are going to own slaves. One of those Virginians is a guy named Washington who frees all of his slaves in his will. Uh, this and a descendant of one of those families is now the lieutenant governor of Virginia. Another bonus the fact. Wor the, wor the world has changed yeah, right. in, 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 in many, many ways. Uh, and, and so. What we see is, yes, th there are opportunities for freedom. So if you go back to that pro-slavery Constitution, and you say, OK, the Constitution protects slavery at every turn, and Marshall is chief justice before there is an abolitionist movement. The abolitionist movement doesn't really begin until the 1830, 1831. Uh, there, there is no fear of Northerners trying to destroy slavery. John Marshall is a Virginian. He's a slave owner. He has numerous opportunities to at least provide freedom for particular individuals who have a claim. There's also a set of cases involving the illegal African slave trade. Almost everybody south of Virginia, I mean, I'm sorry, most everybody north of Virginia, so except for the Carolinas, Georgia, and then Alabama, Mississippi, m almost everybody thinks the African slave trade is an abomination. Even Thomas Jefferson, who owns hundreds of slaves and isn't interested in freeing any of them except his own children and a couple of other collateral relatives. Even Thomas Jefferson thinks the African slave trade is an abomination. In every slave trade case where Marshall decides the case, for some reason, the slave trader gets off. For some reason, the illegally imported slaves are not freed or sent back to Africa. In other cases decided by other justices at the same time, the slave traders are convicted, the ship of the slave trader is seized, the slaves are declared not to be slaves and become free. So, so there's a consistent pattern here. John Marshall doesn't like free black people, and John Marshall is the head of something called the Colonization Society in Virginia. And the purpose of the Colonization Society is to send free black people back to Africa. One final thing, and then I'll let you get a word in edgewise, which is after the Nat Turner Rebellion in Southampton, Virginia, which is a rebellion of slaves against slavery, Marshall goes to the Virginia legislature and petitions the legislature to appropriate money for the Colonization Society. And in his petition, he says, that black people who are free are the problem with Virginia. He says the tragedy in Southampton was caused by free blacks. Now, this is utter nonsense. It is not caused by free blacks. He furthermore says that every free black in Richmond that he knows is a criminal. 
history repeats itself. <laughs> the first time is tragedy, the second time is farce. Uh, but, 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 but so John Marshall says in 1831 that all the free blacks in, in Richmond are criminals. Um, so he's opposed to black freedom. Now, the other piece of this is throughout his life, he's been buying slaves. I don't know how many slaves he owned in his lifetime. I, own, I know that in the, in the 1820s, he probably owns more than 175, but he's given many away already. I can imagine John Marshall sitting in his chambers thinking about this man whose mother has been declared free by the, Mass by the Maryland courts, and Maryland's a slave state, and the Maryland courts have said, this woman is free, and Marshall is saying, you know, I could have bought this guy. I could have bought this guy in Washington, D.C. I could have bought somebody like this in Virginia, and I don't want to lose my slaves merely because I didn't know that the slave I was buying was actually not a slave, so I'm going to rule the other way. It's, so, it's, so I, it's, I, it's, not a, it's not a pretty picture. No, so I just have one final question before I turn it over to for questions from our, our audience. So what are we supposed to do with this knowledge? Does this, of all the things you said today, uh, we're chastened by this knowledge, what does, what does it do, what good does it do uh, for us to see the feet of clay of the greatest justice of the Supreme Court? The truth shall set, set you free, right? Uh, I mean, I think the United States has to come to terms with what is not always a pretty past. Uh, I will say that the city of Richmond is probably leading the country in many ways in coming to terms with what is a very hard past. I did a continuing legal education program on the book in, in, uh, in New Jersey, and one of the lawyers said, well, do you think John Marshall is a great Chief Justice? And I said, absolutely. He is still a great Chief Justice. And the, and the guy wanted to argue with me, as only guys from New Jersey could do. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, you know, he, and he started arguing with me about, well, you know, he owned all these slaves. He bought and sold people. And by the way, he buys and sells people in his life. Uh, the contrast might be with Washington. He wrote the biography of Washington. After the war, Washington says, I do not take men to market like cattle and he never sells another slave. Marshall sells slaves. When one of his sons dies, there's debt. Marshall owns thousands of acres, hundreds of thousands of acres of land. He owns bank stock. He owns stocks in this new thing called the railroad. He owns canal stocks. He's a very wealthy man. He wants to pay off his son's debts, but rather than taking it from his own capital, he just sells a bunch of slaves. And the sale of a slave means that children never see their mothers again. Husbands never see their wives again. Siblings never see each other again. The sale of slaves is the destruction of people's lives. And he just tells his other son, sell the slaves to pay off the debts. So um, that's something we have to come to terms with. It doesn't mean that Marbury versus Madison creating judicial review isn't a brilliant decision. It is. It doesn't mean that McCulloch versus Maryland asserting the power of the federal government and the Constitution to do things isn't probably the most important decision done in the Supreme Court. Um, they are. These are very important decisions. They shaped our court. Um, uh, I was talking to Lacey earlier today, and, 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 and of course, he, co he comes from Farmville, where uh, Virginia closed its schools rather than integrated. And um, he was saying that the decision in Brown v. Board is predicated on Marshall's jurisprudence, and I think that's right. Marshall helps make the court into a great institution. And uh, so if the person, the person says, is Marshall a great chief justice, I would say yes despite the fact when it came to slavery, he is awful, he is abysmal, and he could have done better and should have done better. He knew how to do better. It's not, you know, really, isn't he a man of his times, you know? 
He got 30,000 free blacks in Virginia, proving that men of his times freed their slaves. You've got George Washington, whose biography he writes, freeing his slaves. Marshall could have followed those. Edward Coles, who is James Madison's private secretary, takes all his slaves to Illinois and frees them. So there are people who know better. Uh, and, and one piece of this, I think, is that as Marshall nears death, he burns almost all of his private financial records. All we have left are the notebooks from the 1780s and 1790s. And I suspect one of the reasons he gets rid of his financial records is because he doesn't want some snotty historian like me <laughs> coming along and counting all the people he's buying and selling throughout his life. But he's doing it, and it's affecting his jurisprudence. And that's a tragedy. And until we come to terms with that, we will not come to terms with American history or who we are as a people. And we will not be better. Um, you know, I have Abraham Lincoln on my tie today. Uh, he was the last Virginia president until Woodrow Wilson, right? Because he came from Kentucky, which was a suburb of Virginia. <laughs> and, I'm not sure even we would <laughs> claim that. And, and of course, when his grandfather lived there, it was Kentucky County. And Lincoln talked about <coughs> preserving the Union until the better angels of our world come to play. And the only way we're going to get to be better angels is to understand how we got to where we are. And sadly, Marshall is part of that. Right. You should still keep the Marshall House. You right. should still visit it. You should still donate to the Marshall Foundation <laughs> to support the house. And the Marshall House should, should, should begin to explore seriously the place of the Supreme Court in the US because we have plenty of houses dedicated to, to, to presidents, um, you know, including you know, Marshall's cousin Tommy up in, in, uh, near Charlottesburg, right? Bill. Uh, <laughs> I knew that. But. That's what they say in Fouquier County. That's right. <laughs> but the, the reality is, is that um, we have to come to terms with Marshall to come to terms with who we are as a people. Right. Thank you very much. So let, let's hear uh, applause would be great. <laughs> so we now take questions, and Andy has the microphone. So who'd like to go first? Over on the other side. Are you going to talk about the Dred Scott decision? Well. The book talks about it. I have a whole chapter on Chief Justice Tawney. Um, one of the differences between Marshall and Tawney on slavery is that Tawney, of course, writes one of the most disgraceful decisions in American history in which he is blatantly and grotesquely racist and also blatantly and grotesquely dishonest. So, for example, he says, that blacks have no rights, that whites need respect, forgetting that in 1787, when the Constitution is written, free blacks can vote in at least six states, including North Carolina. So, you know, Tawney says that they, we, I can read them out of the Constitution. He can only do that by ignoring history. He says they can never be citizens of the United States, which, by the way, leads to the very weird result that after 1857, while blacks could not be citizens of the United States according to the law of the land, they were voting for presidential electors, and they were voting for members of the House of Representatives, and they were voting for governors of their own states in a number of states. It's kind of weird. So Tawney has this grotesque attack on not just to preserve slavery, but to attack black people. Marshall is much more circumspect. His decisions are not like Dred Scott in any way, uh, although before the Virginia legislature, he's saying, hey, they're all criminals, and we shouldn't have very many of them. Um, the other piece about Dred Scott is this. People often say, well, we shouldn't measure Chief Justice Tawney by one opinion. And there are a number of scholars who say that, well, he was a very old man when he wrote the case. And you know we shouldn't base his life on 
you know, this one case of an old man. Um, the problem for that is, is that in 1832, 25 years earlier, when Tawney was not an old man, but he was a young, vigorous attorney general of the United States under Andrew Jackson, Tawney wrote an opinion to Andrew Jackson in which he says, black people can never be citizens in the United States, and they have no rights that whites need respect. So everything he said in Dred Scott, he said 25 years earlier. And in between, as, as I note in the book, there are many, many other cases where Tawney aggressively protects slavery, aggressively attacks the rights of free blacks, and aggressively denies the right of northern states to protect their own free black citizens from kidnapping. Marshall doesn't go there. He's not that public about it. He is that public, by the way, when dealing with Indians. He says things about Indians that are as disgraceful as what Tawney says about, um, about black people. Uh, but that's a whole other discussion. But he does describe this very powerfully in the book. What's the next question? I'm, I'm sure where the, where the microphone is. Where, right back here. Oh, oh, you already have it. All the way in the cheap seats here. Oh, okay. Uh, there yes. are none, actually. Thank you so much, Dr. Finkelman, for, for being here and for writing this book. Uh, it taught, it, it's taught a lot of people a lot. Uh, the worst thing, it seems to me, that Marshall wrote about slavery or said is that 1831 uh, address to the Virginia legislature. And I'm just in sort of struggling with uh, his language in that. I wonder if you think it might have something to do with the fact that he was writing it to a legislature um, in order to get money. Um, I, I haven't had a lot of experience testifying, but I know that if you're going to a legislature, you might tell them what they want to hear or what you think will work to accomplish things rather than um, bearing your, your soul. So I just wonder if that's possibly uh, an explanation for some of that language. Certainly he is going there as, a, as an advocate rather than a judge. And he is going there to get money for his society to ship free blacks to Africa. But if you look at all his decisions on black freedom, you come to the conclusion that he simply does not like to see slaves become free. Very late in his life, he adds a clause in his will saying that it is my desire that my faithful servant Robin become free if he would like. Now, that in itself is kind of a tip-off. <laughs> like, why wouldn't Robin want to become free? <laughs> well, the reason is because by 1835, when he's writing this, the only way a free black can remain in Virginia is to get a, uh, an exemption from the law which says you have to leave the state. That 1782 law is long gone. You have to go to the local county court and get the exemption. Now, this is a kind of a window into John Marshall. This man's the Chief Justice of the United States. He is one of the wealthiest men in Richmond, although he lives a very modest life. Again, when I showed a portion of this book to one of Marshall's biographers, and I said he was ridiculously wealthy, his response was, well, he lived such a modest life. How can you say he was wealthy? And, I, and you know, one thing has nothing to do with the other. Uh, you know, um, and uh, you can still live a modest life and be very rich. He could certainly have put in his will, I direct my executor to hire a lawyer to go to the local court to get permission for my faithful servant, Robin, to remain a free black in Richmond so that he can live with his family and friends. And furthermore, I give him a couple of hundred bucks, a thousand bucks, something to start life out with. Instead, what he does is he says, I will give him $50 if he remains in Virginia and can get permission to do so, which Marshall knows he can't without a lawyer to help him, or if he moves to another state, and I will give him $100 if he moves to Liberia. And then he says, but if he chooses not to take his freedom, he can choose an owner from one of my children. And Robin ends up deciding to be the slave of Marshall's daughter and live in Richmond with his daughter and uh, the people he's always known. Now, that to me is a kind of tragic, self-deluding hypocrisy. 
about a man. And that tells us as much about Marshall's view of free blacks as his speech to the Virginia legislature. By the way, if, we, if I take a different understanding, and your understanding is, is Marshall doesn't believe this, what he's saying to the legislature, he's just trying to get money for his cause. Um, you know, there are words for people who, who, who do that sort of behavior and will do anything to get money, and they're not words we usually say in polite company. Uh, and those words I can pronounce, but 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 um, we'll take your word for it. But 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 but, but, the, but the reality is is that that I don't think Marshall is is saying to the legislature anything he doesn't personally believe, and his jurisprudence on freedom indicates this over and over again. I'll give you one other quick example. There's a case in, coming out of Washington D.C. in which a woman claimed, named Mima Queen claims to be free based on the fact that the Queen family has always been free. And that the fact is the Queen's great-grandmother, Mima Queen's great-grandmother was actually a white woman from England. There's nobody alive who knew her grandmother. All of the evidence is what lawyers call hearsay evidence. And of course, there's no documentation. And Marshall says that we cannot allow this suit to go forward because if we allowed hearsay evidence on this issue, all property in America would be jeopardized. All property, all 200,000 acres of land that I know own out west will be jeopardized. In his only dissent in his very long career on the Supreme Court, Justice Gabriel Duval, who had been the Chief Justice of Maryland, writes a very long dissent in which he says, this case is being decided by Maryland law because Maryland law applies in the district. And in Maryland, we always allow slaves to introduce hearsay evidence in freedom cases because, as he says, they have no other evidence. We don't let them learn how to read and write. We don't let them have documentation. And so we always allow this evidence. And then he goes on to point out that there are many cases where you allow hearsay evidence. The, the easy example, which Marshall would have understood, is if I own land from the creek to the old oak tree, and the old oak tree was chopped down two generations ago for firewood, how do I prove where my land ends? By hearsay evidence of where the old oak tree used to be. And so Duval points all this out in his dissent. Marshall ignores it. Um, by the way, if Marshall had ruled the other way, we don't know if Mee McQueen gets to be free because then it just goes to trial. Goes back and the court hears it. The jury decides. But Marshall won't even let her offer the only evidence she has. And that, to me, suggests a man who truly despises the idea of free black people. So wait, one, one final question, I'm told. And here it is. You note that... Uh, in the beginning years of Marshall's term as Chief Justice, uh, he wrote extremely important decisions for mm -hmm. the future of the United States. But that later on, years later, he loses control of the Supreme Court, which he apparently had mm -hmm. in the first years. Why? Um, well, he loses control because new justices come on who are not overawed by John Marshall. And uh, James Monroe's appointments are um, simply more independent. They're not, they're not, they don't see Marshall as, as this great man that they have to follow every time he opens his mouth. Uh, and so um, Marshall simply, by the way, Marshall still writes opinions into the 1830s to the very end. He's in the majority a lot. But his, pers his winning percentage, if you will, drops. Uh, and, and so he is, is less powerful. Um, in the early years, it's John Marshall's court. And, and almost all the justices agree. I mean, the Duval dissent is famous because in the, in the first 15, 20 years of Marshall's career, there are years where you only have two or three dissents. It's really a, a I'm almost unanimous court. And, and I want to I say one thing about this, because it illustrates the, 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 this switch. 
illustrates Marshall in other ways. Um, in 1825, he hears a, a case involving the African slave trade. And the argument is made that the African slave trade violates international law. By this time, it's been banned by the United States, banned by Great Britain, banned by a number of other places. And the United States has declared that slave trading is piracy. And on conviction of slave trading, the captain of the ship shall be hanged. This is pretty serious business. Marshall says, and, and, for, and furthermore, the argument is that slave, slave trading violates natural law. It is, it is, as a country based on the Declaration of Independence, slave trade goes to the very core of our being. Marshall says, in his opinion, uh, this is a case called the Antelope, that natural law has no place in American jurisprudence because we have to follow international law. And he says international law doesn't ban the slave trade. And furthermore, uh, we have to follow constitutional law, but not natural law. Three years later, M Marshall is on the losing end of a case involving a bankruptcy law. Bankruptcy laws, of course, are laws that allow you, if you are completely bankrupt, to declare bankruptcy, get out of your debts, and start life over. Marshall loses because Marshall hates bankruptcy laws. He's loaned out lots of money to lots of people. He owns bank stock. He doesn't like bankruptcy. And he says in his dissent that bankruptcy laws violate natural law. <laughs> so when it comes to the African slave trade, oh, well, well, kidnapping people in Africa and chaining them up and bringing that doesn't, that might violate natural law, but we can't have natural law in our jurisprudence. But when it comes to a bankruptcy, when it comes to what really matters, we can. Now, he's a loser in this case. Um, it's one of his few dissents. Um, his early opinions, and even some of his later opinions, are monumentally important. Uh, uh, of, the, of the 10 cases most cited by the US Supreme Court in the entire history of the US Supreme Court, five of them are Marshall opinions. He is a great justice. He is a great legal mind. I only wish that he had used some of that intelligence and that brilliance to think about freedom instead of merely thinking about property and fear of people who don't look exactly like him. Thank you very much, Paul.